Well, doctors, 26 of you are online, 101 registered, and I keep these numbers and I see these numbers growing every time we do these webinars. Welcome to part two of the microosseous perforation and talking a little bit about accelerating your liner treatment. I'm Dr. Atai, as always, a pleasure, and you know, it is great to have these doctors online, but when I say these, every one of you have, uh, I may have a relationship or know or see you on the lecture. As you know, I'm a, a speaker for multiple companies, including Align and now Propel, and using some of the um, technology that's there in front of us and being able to push the products for our, not only patients, but the reality of how do we make these teeth that the ClinCheck software or the Invisalign aligners, or some of you might use straight wire ortho, in getting them into the right position of teeth? Well, let me explain. My biggest issue has always been, how do I do easy dentistry and be able to put teeth in the right position? Last time we had spoken in the part one, we talked about some of these cases. How do we get these cases to track? How do we get cases uh, as such as this patient who's a class two, who's had history of ortho before, who's actually had a you know missing bicuspids and extracted bicuspids, relapsed, open bite, big orthognathic potential surgery, but how do we get her with non-invasive type of dentistry and be able to position her using some of the products such as the technology of micro osseous perforations making the bone work for us during the orthodontic phase using the clear aligners predictably and getting these patients into a position where the occlusion and the bite is exactly what our software is telling us where it should be and in this particular case you can see very openly i show patients i talk to doctors that's what the perforations look like look like tiny little bee stings but during the progress of less than a year, I'm able to get these patients from where you saw a completely malocluded patient who's got a class two. And really, what are her options? Her options were either having some sort of an orthognathic type scenario or in less than a year when she's getting ready to get married, have a smile line and a posterior bite landing beautifully in less than a year. I was able to do that in working on hard tissue as well as working on soft tissue using the orthodontic treatment that I use with Propel as well as Invisalign or clear liner treatments. These cases, it's a published case and you're welcome to go on atai.com, A-T-A-I-I.com, read about it and read about the process that I went through with this patient, ClinCheck software and how I was able to get her in the particular movements that we want. So right into it, what is microosseous perforation, or better known as these days as MOPS? Microosseous perforation is really safe. It, it's a simple treatment. Those of you who know of this process, I'll just do a quick little review. Those of you who are new listening to this webinar, well, very simply said, it is a beneficial in most all orthodontic patients. Patients who have conventional orthodontics or clear aligner treatment. It enables you to remodel the bone. What does that mean? Why is the board remodeling of bone important? Well, first and foremost, bone remodeling is needed because as you move teeth translatively or you start uprighting teeth, the roots are embedded into bone. So we need bone that cooperates. And really, I just want to kind of intro you in the histology of bone remodeling and how osteoblastic and osteoclastic, going back to our dental school days, why it's important, how we're able to get these bone that are osteoclastic activity and osteoblastic activity higher, faster, and work as we put the force on the tooth and root, can we get that to cooperate? So I want to show you this quick little video in explaining, and this really helps the dental auxiliaries as well, because I know a few of you are listening as well. The density of bone is modulated by a group of cells, including osteoclasts, which are multinucleated cells that resorb bone, and osteoblasts, which refill the resorption cavities created by osteoclasts. Osteoclasts anchor themselves to the surface of bone. This creates a microenvironment underneath the cell, which is referred to as the sealed zone. 
Within this zone, the osteoclasts create an acidic environment that dissolves the bone's mineral content. Once the mineral content of the bone has been dissolved, enzymes released from osteoclasts remove the remaining collagenous bone matrix to complete the process of resorption. Following resorption, osteoblasts move into the resorption space and start to produce and deposit organic matrix called osteoid. This cycle of bone resorption and formation is referred to as remodeling. There is also a process where bone formation by osteoblasts occur without prior bone resorption by osteoclasts. This results in an increase in bone mass and is referred to as bone modeling. Bone modeling promotes the growth of bones and is important for maintaining bone strength. So what you just saw is really the basic mechanics of how bone is formed on a daily basis. Osteoblastic activity, osteoclastic activity, creating this bone remodeling. As you start to put force, as you start to try in moving teeth in orthodontics, we know that the rate of this bone remodeling is contingent not on the force that's being pay, pay, placed, meaning if you put a greater attachment, a bigger attachment, a bigger torque on the tooth, that doesn't necessarily create that movement. What happens is you can potentially get root resorption. You can potentially get a, the root that's not going to be in a well positioned and that osteoblastic and osteoclastic activity, the word bone remodeling does not happen. Cytokine, is stimulation of some sort of inflammatory process and allows this to get the bone moving for us and those cellular activity to go at a better rate in such a way that we can now do what? We can now have where we are now incorporating some sort of inflammatory process to create that consistency and we can potentially speed up our orthodontic treatment and typically by really reducing our, our, our treatment time in less than 50%. So how does this work? Well, MOPS, again, microosseous perforations, the mechanics of it is if you look at the root in the trabeculae of bone, you have the osteoblast, which is typically the bone builders, and the osteoclast that the bones are really getting destroyed and you get that remodeling happening. And eventually, we're gonna want the bone to be modeled and hardened. Well, at what point does that happen? When you add a force and the tooth at that point is created by some sort of momentum and movement, you're now creating an inflammation and that inflammation starts the cytokine activity and the bone remodeling begins and tooth starts to move. And in this particular case, if we introduce some sort of a traumatic scenario to just the outer portion of the bone, not directly in into the trabeculae or into the root, but rather in between the root and creating a small perforation or a small introduction to the periosteum portion of the bone, the outer layer, you create that stimulation, cytokine activity and inflammatory process. So now all of this starts the bone remodeling process and the tooth moves faster, better and more predictable. That's the basis of it. So within 10 minutes, I was able to give you the idea of how do we get this movement of teeth to happen with mops. But the reality is it took me about a good two years to understand the mechanics with just clear aligner movements. Now wire in brackets, that is also yet another treatment that we wanna help. Any tooth movement that you're having done orthodontically, we're going to want to do what? Have bone that is cooperative with us. So looking at this, cytokines then play an important role not just in bone remodeling, but the basis for orthodontic tooth movements. And in understanding that any area that sometimes you have bones that break, you know, arm or, or, or tibia or, 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 or some sort of a portion of your bone that actually breaks, well, what happens to that fracture site? What happens to that area, that ossification? You actually have these lovely bone that's now been healed even stronger and better. 
Now, I do see um, some questions coming in. So um, we have, you know, some of the doctors that are that are in response, and I'll make sure that we go back to the case that I showed you with the bicuspid. I will go back and show that patient to you, and and review her whole process. And my agenda in showing you some of these uh, processes is understanding why the inflammatory process is important during orthodontics. In at this point, you try to avoid having the patients take any kind of anti-inflammatory. You know, Tylenol would be good. We like inflammation. We like the cytokine activity. We like a lot of these different types of um, uh, uh, bone remodeling to happen because we're going to stimulate the bone and create that cytokine activity. So what are some of the indications for microosis perforation? Well, I, I like to try to release some challenging movements, you know, and I, I'll go back to that original patient I showed you. In looking at Shannon's case, one of the key problems we had was plastic aligners are not really good at distalizing. She has her third molars in. And, you know, ideally the upper arch would be ideal in distalizing. I mean, again, she's a class two. How do I do this? I Either we have to create some sort of interapproximation or IPR the upper arch. Uh, potentially, we, we can do a lot of other treatments. But the reality was she wanted the most minimal, non-invasive uh, treatment. So one view of it was, can we create bone that's cooperative? Can we create that perforations, create that stimulation, create that inflammatory process so the cytokine activity can get increased and start that, that molding? And the reality is that in this particular case, choosing the clear liner treatment uh, was easier than trying to distalize and, and maybe potentially extract upper wisdom teeth and going through a multiple different arrays. And as you see transitionally, as we're moving teeth, as we've created a little bit of space because she had a um, diastema in eight and nine, we now are able to kind of slowly move those bicuspid and molars back into position and getting her again into an ideal, um, at least a smile line. And so, yes, it was, a, it was a cosmetic solution. But what is our agenda here? Our agenda is, can we do what the ClinCheck said? My goal was not to try to correct the midline. And my goal was not to try to get anywhere other than the anterior coupling to finish in that one millimeter overjet overbite to give her a better smile line. So in this particular case, we added some uh, IPR uh, distal to the premolars. And, you know, that was our main agenda. We only need the bone that cooperated with us. We really needed that stimulation of the cytokine activity in, in having her get ready for her big day and her wedding day. So again, um, in talking about these cases, understanding that there's a couple of different options in you creating um, this in conjunction with orthodontics. Again, whether you use YM brackets or whether you are using Invisalign or clear aligners, um, you can use these in this particular case for, uh, you know, less than four months. How was I able to do that? Well, simple. Again, we create the inflammatory process. Main agenda for this particular patient was tooth number eight that needed to be uh, restored. Uh, but I, I'd like to put that tooth in a better uh, by patient was being deployed and had minimal time, could not have YM brackets. So we did the clear aligners, did the perforations, and were able to get a better result in having them speed up changing the trays and the Invisalign into a much better and faster moving, if you will, uh, treatment than every two weeks. So in patients who are compromised uh, with, with, with an, or on, on anti-inflammatories, well, these patients are not ideal because what are they doing? They're constantly taking anti-inflammatories. And again, that goes back to the Motrin scenario. We like inflammation. We want to have that uh, type of uh, perforation. So we prefer in patients at this point, I don't take them if they are on some sort of a um, chronic anti-inflammatories or patients who've been treated with a you know, uh, any kind of Sally Fields drug, as I like to talk about, or patients who are ASA compromised. That's that's the uh, Beniva or the uh, bisphosphate. So those patients are contraindications for this type of treatment. There are a couple of methods in creating this accelerated cytokine activity. Um, number one, uh, 
you know, obviously they're, they're patient controlled ones that patient themselves can, can use in accelerating or at least using some sort of micro pulses and remodeling or accelerating that type of, uh, osteoclastic and osteoblastic activity. So in this particular case, I've seen, I'm sure you've seen a couple of different, uh, products in the market, which uh, some of our light activated in bone regeneration, some of our vibration techniques, uh, cost of which is great. You're talking sometimes six to eight hundred to a thousand dollars per device. Um, you know, I like the uh, mops uh, or the vibration that now we know that Propel has uh, for better aligner seating. And we're going to discuss about the V Pro 5 as well today, talking about some of the vibrations that uh, uh, Propel has introduced uh, to the market. In my particular um, office, I like the microosseous perforation. I don't like the cordogotomy. I don't like the piezo surgery. Um, those are way above and beyond what I need to do. But that still is Wilkodontics and in the market. Um, there are patients who have treatments done in less than six months. They literally get their gums flapped back. It's a little bit more invasive and there's a, a, a recovery time. Uh, but there is a, a, a room in the market that allows and using this theory of cytokine activity and inflammatory process by introducing that traumatic little introduction of bone and perforation to the bone and sometimes, you know, actually cutting of the bone, um, allowing that, if you will, uh, activity, the inflammatory process to begin. For me, small little areas are much easier. And, you know, the Propel product allows me to create that micro perforation and just enough where I don't have prolonged bleeding or any kind of uh, scenarios. And, you know, it, it doesn't it doesn't scoop out the bone or it doesn't drill out the bone. And I know some of you doctors say, well, what if I, I use my drill? What if I just go ahead and, and use a, a drill to kind of do a tissue punch? Well, you can. The problem is the healing area uh, your first a scooping, scooping out with a burr, um, not ideal to do so. I know sometimes we think maybe a size two burr. You know these stainless steel tips that are the perforations that we create are just tr there to create small little traumatic areas to create the inflammatory process, not to uh, degradate or remove bone. And you know you're going to have a, a a copious area that could potentially happen to bone re necrosis, and it's a danger area for me. And I'd rather use some of the delivery devices that are in the market. I, I know that some of you might know of these uh, where they have a little small tip that creates the cut into the bone. There's the accelerator that, that uh, Propel has, which is the microosseous perforation, which is basically a single use. It has a little light at the end when you hit the designated level of three millimeters or five millimeters. Uh, the light turns on. Uh, there's actually the this, the reusable handle. Uh, this one is what I actually ha have been using up until just recently where it has a disposable tip. I, I like the open tip. It allows me to put smaller perforations and it looks much smaller than the other. In terms of depth, I can get closer to that three to maximum five millimeter depth to create the tra traumatic event. And now currently I've been using the Accelerator PT, which is basically a, a power-driven handpiece. I love that piece because now it has a small little tips. Um, it's a power driver. I don't have to twist my, my, my hands. But just to show you some of you doctors who might not have seen part one of this uh, webinar, um, this is kind of what it looks like when you use the Accelerator. And I'll kind of show you what it looks like. So we're back, Dr. Atai. As I mentioned earlier, we have a case. We're going to show you how to do the Propel. Patient in for Invisalign treatment of 24 aligners from an anterior view. As you can see, there's intrusions going on, some resolving of the lower crowding. I'll show you a mandibular view of what's happening. The mandibular view from the beginning to end, we're rotating on the teeth's axis. And what happens in order to do that, we need to have a bone that's going to cooperate with us. I like to propose Propel. My patient's already accepted. I always like to show the patient that we are taking a sterile bag. The device is a device which is simply, as you can well see, that's the numbers on it. We're going to go ahead and set it at three millimeter. And I always like to use the Vaseline and kind of just put it so on the lips of the patient and along the device itself. So let's go ahead and see how the device will work. We're actually going to start with the number 27 area, small little pressure. Simply, as you can see, we're in. That's typically three twists and back. That's as simple as the device. How did we do? 
Excellent. Excellent, the patient says. Well, this patient happens to be my assistant. So, you know, we were able to kind of uh, do some uh, movements on the actual teeth by creating, um, you know, again, the mycopause per per perforation procedure itself, you know, it's not as invasive. Uh, it allows the, the bone uh, to, in some doctors, uh, dispute that. The reality is, uh, you know, I'm, I'm about 120 cases into these. I always uh, use the patients and explain to them that we have to make sure that if we've done clear liner treatments, and again, I use Invisalign, um, you know, my patients, uh, you know, they have the wire and bracket option. They usually don't take it, but I always give them a form and a consent form. Uh, that again is on the tie.com site that you can uh, download uh, that I've put together along with Propel's help. And, uh, you know, typically I either give them topical or some sort of infl infl infiltration. Uh, Definitely, I like to do a chlorhexidine rinse for at least 60 seconds or so. And, you know, you can set the device um, in between the roots. Really, intra root is where you want to go. And just to create that uh, amount of uh, traumatic or, or, or micro fracture, if you will, of the cortical bone area. And in your cases, some of you doctors who are Invisalign doctors and are seeing the uh, sites on the ClinCheck software, the blue dots are not shown. This is just for me to kind of explain where the ideal position would be. I usually like to go from mesial to the molar to mesial to the molar or premolars. Um, some cases I don't move posterior teeth, some cases I do. So any teeth that you're planning on moving, posterior teeth, typically about five millimeters setting going into the bone if they have dense bone. Three millimeters is, is pretty much where I'm at on anywhere from K9 to K9, and to, depending on the bone density itself, you'll actually feel as you're twisting or as you're drilling in with the power driver, you'll actually feel the tissue goes right through, and then you hit a little hard substance, which is obviously the bone, periosteum outside, and then I just back off once I create that small little tap onto the bone, and it kind of grips onto it. So typically one to two micro perforations with the propel on the buckle. Um, I don't do the lingual portions of the teeth. And I, again, I go premolar to premolar. If I'm uprighting posterior teeth or moving posterior teeth or the first or second molars, I go at that portion too. And, you know, tr treatment considerations is typically one to two treatments you may need during the course of the treatment patients. Um, nor normally, most of my cases, instead of having them change their liner every two weeks, I have them change it once a week, which means I've actually shortened the Invisalign treatment time. And those of you who do clear liners, you know that we always are, are, are advised to change the trays every 14 days. Now I have them change once a week. In some cases, and some orthos I've heard, they change every three days rather than once a week, given this, uh, you know, perforations that are created. I don't go in greater than three millimeters if I don't have to. Um, as long as I twist and I kind of feel the bone, I pull back. But on posterior, the molars and the buccal area, um, some areas may need it. The acceleration, uh, typically for me, I like using the power driver. The power driver is easy, easier. These tips are, are, you can't sterilize them. They're one-time use per tips. And, you know, I like using these, these, these tips because I don't have to use the twisting of the hand and I like the power driver. And I kind of will show you what that looks like with a power driver on the patients. So our lovely doctor here who's a volunteer, uh, Lauren has actually had Propel with the hand device and now she's gonna have it with the power driver and she's gonna tell us her experience. So uh, we're just gonna go through here. I've already turned it on. And you can just go ahead and put right on. You feel a little pressure? Mm -hmm. Okay, and I'm already in the bone. I'm gonna reverse it. And I reversed that. So that's about three millimeters. And it's, it's typically kind of looks like you see the perforations and if you, do a CT of the area, you can kind of see where you're about four to six millimeters um, in that micro fracture. And how do I know that? Well, what I've been doing is every patient, I do take a CT follow up about six months or so and seeing how long does this hole or does this little perforation last. And really it shows after three months that the, the body starts to repair itself just like an extraction site, just like any other site that you're preparing for an implant. And that, that cytokine activity ends up lasting about three months or so. And 
by then you notice that the teeth and the bone starts to get you know back to normal a little bit because the body's actually healing itself so do you need to do another perforation do you not it depends on the extensive uh, case that you're you're actually trying to treat so healing time is anywhere between you know one to two weeks as far as the soft tissue is concerned maximum three weeks but the actual perforation in the bone does last three months plus uh, what is the and how long do mops last Again, that's the biological mechanics that we were talking about. I think it's about 10 to 12 weeks that the cytokine activity and the, you know, remodeling of the bone is accelerated, if you will. And, you know, in, in the microosseous perforation, if you see initially, I actually deliver the aligners, put the attachment on, do the mops, and then you follow up in a week. In, in this case, I did it because I wanted to kind of show the doctors what it looks like in a week and the soft tissue by the third week is completely healed up. But you can see small little uh, areas that are still trying to heal. But inside the cortical bone, you're still getting some healing that lasts about three to four months. In this particular case, you saw Nadia. Um, she's a, a little bit of an overjet, a little bit of a deep bite. And the aligner treatment was coming back as 26 aligners. That's about 52 weeks. Um, putting me a little bit over a year. So obviously with the one propel treatment is all I needed. I didn't need two. Uh, we were finished with the case in less than six months. She changed the aligners once every four days and we were able to kind of line up her bite and give her that, that most of the major movements done in less than six months time period. And now we wait for the bite to settle down and, and we go into retention phase. So you can kind of see some of these cases that when you use the Propel device, you know, I, I, I have sometimes I want to get in and get out with the orthodontics and setting it up aesthetically, or do I want to go through and kind of what degree of difficulty am I dealing with? Well, I want teeth that are going to do exactly what the ClinCheck software tells me. So if I've got a scenario where it's a class three, this particular patient's got an edge to edge bite. You know, he's, he's had multiple consults. He's told about wire and brackets. You know, he didn't want to have any of those, and he really wanted to see if there's another option for him. So he's missing the premolar. Do I create the space? Do I, pro, you know, procline the teeth forward, try to lingualize the lower arch back? He's definitely got some surgical uh, considerations, but he didn't want to do any of that other than just simply aesthetic setup. And all can I do it in less than a year time period? Well, I want to make sure that I can track. I want to make sure that the trays are are following. So in this particular case, you can see that you know, in January we did the start of the actual uh, initial photos. By the time the aligners got to us a month later, we started him with the Invisalign treatment, putting on the perforations, putting on the attachments, and using the Propel device and getting the patient. I always uh, like to take a CT and kind of show um, where those perforations are this, and I can kind of, where the arrows kind of show you where these areas of, of just a radius of the amount of perforation and you kind of look and see, I just kind of drew that uh, uh, with the little blue marks showing you where the perforations are actually created. And really, how long does this last? Uh, if you follow up in three months in this particular site, you see the bones already starting to heal, but there's still a tiny uh, area that shows that the perforations are um, still not quite healed up. So we know that in three months, I'm still getting that bone activity. Does that mean that the teeth are still moving? Well, I mean, look at see the amount of straightening I got in three months from where he was just off the CT. You can kind of um, look and, and following in six months and then nine months. So this case, what was supposed to take me a lot longer, I was able to cosmetically finish it. Now I'm going to work on that bicuspid and that area and, and settling it. I'd like to lingualize the lower arch, but most of my heavy movements were done in less than a year. And that was the main agenda. If I can get most of the heavy movements out of the way first, now the rest is just kind of playing cosmetically and I don't need to do another perforation on this patient or create another uh, uh, mop scenario. Um, and, and you can kind of see the healing of the sites are already in progress. Um, the bone, it, did it move with the tooth? Yeah, it actually moved. I, I didn't see any kind of a loss of bone. If anything, to me, it looks that it actually looks dense and even harder and better, just like how you kind of flap the gums back and, you know, do some, some perio. But 
when you start to look at this particular case, the bone density itself actually looks a lot greater. Now, that's something that I'm looking into, or do we actually get a better result? Does the bone actually get more dense and more strong? Does it become a little bit better of a, of a foundation prior to um, not doing the mops or prior to ortho? Where, where do we land? Is it the better bite that the bone's being stable, or is it because we're introducing some sort of a cytokine activity, inflammatory process, the bone remodeling, and now you create, just like that broken bone I mentioned earlier, a better site, a better healed area? So this is something that uh, that I myself am investigating. Uh, in the meanwhile, Align themselves uh, have 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 come up with a multiple attachment scenarios that are helping us doctors, you know, put in these optimized attachments and move the teeth better. And the reality is, for me, it's not just about the force or the attachment. Again, I need the foundation to work with me. Now, one of the things that, that has been introduced uh, by uh, Propel is the actual vibration scenario, the V-Pro5. And this is something that was handed to me and I said, hey, Dr. Tai, take a look at this and let us know if, if this is something that you can actually use in your office. And I looked at it uh, ideally for a potentially an aligner cedar. You know, one of the, some of the times we don't get these teeth tracking and some patients don't really want to have the perforations, don't want to, you know, don't go through the mops, but you know, what do we give them? A chewy to bite down on the aligner. So the V-Pro5 in my office is being used. It's a higher frequency of vibration that seats the aligners a little better. And it's definitely helped uh, the, the comfort of the patient. And you know, I can tell you, has it been accelerated tooth movement? I've been telling my patients to change it a little sooner instead of the 14 days, the 10 days. I haven't been bold and brave to tell the patients, hey, change it every three days on the, on the aligner uh, because I'm just worried about the tracking. But in this reality is, I've been, what I've been seeing is, has it helped the bone growth and remodeling? So what I like to kind of show you is, show you the mouthpiece um, in itself. There is a USB flash drive and there is a wall adapter charger as well. A, a, the oscillator itself that actually vibrates. It is at a higher front frequency and you only have the patient do this for five minutes a day. And that's pretty much what I gave my patient. There's a software that is attached to it. It's a step-by-step -step, uh, scenario that the patient kind of goes through and we're able to assign the device to the patient so I know exactly how long they wore it, you know, at what point of the day they're wearing it, and I get to kind of track my patient. So I've been very happy with that. It actually increases the compliance of the patient uh, who's wearing the um, VPro5, and, and uh, the software is, is something that I love in, in making sure that compliance, again, is being followed. Um, the patient experience that I had, my preliminary study was basically I'm comparing it to what other products in the market. There are currently when the aligner doesn't seat, like in Mackay's scenario, it, you know, he again was one of these class threes. We got to kind of lingualize teeth. Can we procline teeth forward? Get him out of that. He's been through the surgical consult. He's been through the YM bracket consult and he pretty much, you know, He's fine with having a, a, a aesthetic bite. We got him where the teeth were. Uh, we removed all the crowding. We removed all the overlapping, but the aligner stopped tracking. And as you can see, lateral to lateral, my biggest problem was the aligner wasn't tracking well. And yes, I checked the IPR. Yes, we did all the other protocols, but some of the options were, you know, how do we get this aligner to seat? Um, I always say in my lectures, check the contact points. We did. And then I say, well, grab some chewies and have the patient chew on some chewies. What was happening is when the force was applied on the chewies, the aligner would fit on. But as soon as you release the force, guess what? It would relapse back. And the plastic aligners themselves have this, this capacity of not really seating well if you're just going based on force and how long do they wear the chewies 20 minutes 30 minutes a day how long do they chew on that and it was kind of hard to track and get the compliance moving forward so the alternative was using the v pro 5 in trying to get the vibrations and alternative way to to seat the aligners and in this particular case the patient would actually uh, wear it five minutes a day and at one point i think he even texted me that he's wearing it and he's happier and for just five minutes a day, about 10 days into it, once the contacts were, were, were addressed, we made sure that the 
a patient comes back and sure enough, the aligner was seated and we moved forward at least better than where it was. Rather than me having to stop, take the attachments off, reboot the aligners and wait that two to three week time period before a new set of aligners are sent back. So my initial experience was very good with the, um, the B-Pro5 as, as a, you know, a technology that's there for patients who are able to have a better scenario of, of seating the aligners. And the reality is, can I now take this to the next level? Can I use this for, if we're talking about, you know, parameters of bone remodeling, if we're talking about, is this a scenario where we can get teeth to be moving and can I now tell the teeth and the aligners, hey, go ahead, we're going to change you every seven days. Well, what I wanted to discuss is patients with mixed dentitions. My biggest issue on these patients are patient has missing cuspid, has a deciduous cuspid, and I didn't really want to put much torque on that deciduous cuspid. I didn't really want to do any kind of mops. I didn't want to do microosseous perforations. And I wanted to see if we can at least have the result. And if you see on the aligner, there's power ridges built in, some proclinations. And we like to do a veneer once the bite is in better occlusion on that cuspid deciduous tooth. So she was using it not just for movement of teeth, but can it be a stabilization and a retention as well? Is the bone going to actually cooperate and become more dense? Well, in theory, is that possible? The reality is I wanted to take it and take a look at this patient in the CT scan, taking a look at the bone prior and looking at it in six to eight months later and trying to find out, okay, where is this patient? And did we get the result that we wanted. And in this particular case, the deciduous tooth itself, we did not mess with. We left it alone. We were able to get the teeth around it moving. And if you look at the top left of your screen, that's a CT scan from pre-op that we started. And on the bottom of your screen, that is about going into six months into treatment. And you know the conclusions in my in my case were we were having her change the aligners once uh, every 10 days. And then we shortened the time for about seven. Everything tracked fine. And did we get more of a dense bone or not? That's hard to say. But what I can tell you is looking at it from a cross section, I, was, I, I, can, I can notice a little difference that the teeth did move along with the bone using the V-Pro5. And it looks to me that we got a little bit more density and that's the left side of her uh, bite. And then looking at her post-aligner treatments in the fitted of the aligners. And we kind of had to change it once a week. And we went from 14 to 10 days to once a week, and she used the V-Pro5 the entire time. So, you know, I, I six out of seven patients, they like the aligner seating process. Um, I, every patient really found it easy uh, to use, and they kind of preferred using that in lieu of obviously chewies. And, you know, these are patients who don't want to go through the mop, or maybe you had the mop, and the final scenario would be with the uh, V-Pro5. You know, in my practice, um, you know, these, these, are, these are inexpensive. They're, they're less than 400 bucks. Um, I can actually handle that. The, the mops are about 100, 120 bucks. I can handle that depending on which patient I, I, I can go. Typically my scenario is a $500 charge for any kind of this, uh, treatments, whether I do the mops or I do the V Pro 5, whichever treatment that I propose to the patient, it's about a $500 um, upgrade. Um, it works in my office well because the patients kind of understand that it, there is a need for some sort of a treatment that they need. So what I wanted to do is kind of give you a some clinical um, information. I know some of you had some questions that went through, but I wanted to kind of go through some of the data that we had discussed last time. So if I know some questions have been coming in uh, with some of you doctors, um, and one of them was uh, restorative. Can you do a combo restorative and, um, you know, uh, Invisalign treatment. So yes, definitely you can do a combo treatment. Um, you know, in this particular case, you know, Aaron's uh, case, we knew going into it, we're going to have to deal with the four anterior teeth. I definitely wanted to get the crowding out of the way. Obviously, as you can see, we want to get a better anterior coupling as well as some uprighting. He's got a V-shaped upper arch, some lower crowding. And can the plastic aligners move? 
uh, by themselves? Well, I had to introduce the mops. In this case, we went there. I did the five millimeters in the posteriors and the three in the anterior region. Some areas we can see with the two perforations, other areas with the one, I put them on the attached gingiva. And if you look very closely here, typically on the attached gingiva, there's less bleeding than on the free gingiva. So anywhere that you have on the free gingiva or in the vestibular area, you get more bleeding. And I try to just kind of hit it right around the belly of the tooth if I can in, in between the tooth. Once we were able to move the tooth, then I can move forward my restorations. I still wanted to lingualize the lower teeth. I still wanted to move the lower teeth back a little bit. So I continued on with my lower Invisalign in getting the patient's bite in a little better position. But all of this was seamlessly throughout my treatment, including the veneers that were placed um, as we get the bite uh, lined up a little better. The angulations of the canines now are tipped a little better. And you know the reality is, you start to look at some of these cases and it starts to combine the both general and the orthodontic and in this case, the Invisalign process with the ClinCheck starts to work a little better for me because the bone now is more cooperative, uh, if you will. That's probably the best explanation I can, I can tell you that I have seen. Um, so yes, definitely you can combine the two treatments. I start the, the Propel, the microosseous perforation at the time when I deliver my attachments. So I definitely start those treatments right at the same time. As you can see in getting these tipping motions of the root, it's very difficult to, to do a plastic aligners by itself, um, but I don't use any rubber bands. I don't use any wire and brackets. So I only rely on the attachments and again, making sure that my movements are in cohesive with the actual uh, treatments that the ClinCheck software is telling me. So that was one of the questions that came through. Let me read some of your other questions here. Um, is there a, okay, in moving teeth, in moving teeth so fast, do you create unstable situation? Are the teeth more likely to relapse? So let's talk about these cases. Um, when you move these teeth and you're having the aligner being changed every week, remember there has to be a stabilization period. You can't just you know, and that's why I typically do maybe one propel uh, in the initial of the treatment. And as I move the teeth, I put them in position and I wait. So in this particular case, if you can see the lower arch, once we were done, we, we have to wait. We, we don't just go straight into retention. Anywhere between six weeks to eight weeks, I wait prior to finalizing retention. I don't do any spot or occlusal adjustments. I do use the uh, gum line as my if you will, my aesthetic line. But the reality is, yes, you can get relapse if you move teeth and don't stabilize these, 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 these teeth. In this particular case, once I finished with the Invisalign and the veneers, I put them in an upper CR splint with the lower lingual wire. Um, again, I wanted to get the lowers back a little better. So you can definitely get relapse. You need that stabilization, which is why in this particular case, the VPRO5, what I've seen when I'm now creating some sort of a vibration, some sort of stimulation, I'm getting those cellular activity. And in my mind, it looks like they're actually healing, if you will, stabilizing. And the bone is now not being pushed in, in getting these roots moving all around, but rather now you get the more osteoblastic. And those of you who do a lot of ortho, you know that the wiggly teeth isn't going to scare us during treatment. It's only after treatment, if you consistently have wiggly teeth, there's a problem, right? So yes, if you move too fast and you don't stabilize and you don't wait uh, be be before you get the final retention, you can potentially have a soup of relapse and that's not good. So we wanna make sure that at least we have that stabilization period, six to eight weeks post ortho treatment and they wear their retention uh, you know, full time for six months as if they had their Invisalign and then after that, they can do nighttime wear, but most of the time I tell them six months to a year, full-time retention to make sure everything's stable before they wear nighttime wear. So um, is, there a risk, uh, is there a risk of hitting tooth root? What is the result if this happens? So let's talk about that. Um, the, university, the New York University did a study where they actually had um, perforations that were done on 
teeth that are bicuspids that were supposed to be extracted. And they actually intentionally went and used the Propel device and actually hit the roots. And what they found was that, first of all, just so you know, patients are going to feel a lot of pain prior to you uh, hitting the roots. And you're going very deep. And uh, that's why ideally you want to go in between the roots. So if you looked at this patient in Aaron's case, um, when, when, when the Propel was done, I went in between the roots. So if you see on the cuspid on tooth number 11, there's an actual angulation. I followed the roots in between, interdental. So if you do happen to go too deep beyond the three millimeters, right? Why do I say beyond three? Because your bone itself, okay, when, you, when you're looking at the histology of bone itself, is what? You have the outside portion, which is the attached gingiva. Then from there, you have the um, actual cortical bone, if you will, or the periosteum, if you will. And then you have the uh, trabeculae of bone. So you've got to go through at least one or two millimeters prior to you hitting the root. And if you consistently go beyond three millimeters, directly aiming it at the root of the tooth, then you'll hit it. So my advice is don't go. Go in between. But the patients are going to feel a little bit of heat, and then they'll feel um, pain, tremendous amount of pain. So they'll scream prior to you because you'll get that push on the root first, then as you kind of go through. Now, when you're using the power driver, it's a little bit more difficult to feel uh, going in through. You actually feel soft and also it just hits the bone. And I reverse it back like you saw. But in, in a hand driver one, in the one that's the disposable or the, the tips that are disposable, those you actually feel the hardness of the bone and you can back right off. So beyond three millimeters, you will feel that. But I just want to give you a cross section of what you're looking at if you're going beyond three millimeters. Yes, you will have some pain on these patients. All right, so let's see what else we've got. Um, all right, one of the doctors uh, is asking me, so one of the doctors are asking me about the, the photo I was just showing on Aaron, the final restoration of what it looks like on the CT that I was showing you. So this was Aaron's case post-treatment, and this was a CT a year after to kind of show you that there's no residual perforations or any kind of holes left behind. Uh, the bone does heal, and it does look like that there's, there's some density forming around the roots of the teeth. Like, but that's important for the stabilization period. So that's what that CT was about one year post-treatment. Um, so as again, I'll, I'll take your questions as we're going through uh, these slides. All right. So uh, pretty much what, what uh, I wanted to kind of cover with you was in discussing the uh, technology, if you will, that Propel has. There are um, multiple avenues in uh, talking about pricing, and those of you uh, doctors who, who uh, always wonder, well, how do I add this to my, um, you know, armatarium? Well, in my office, I base fees on the amount of uh, crowding or spacing or the advanced case versus moderate case. Um, I do have a standardized pricing. And, and if I need to, I can add the Propel in there or not. So it can either be part of my treatment plan, the Propel's already in, included in that, and uh, depending on what part of the country you're located in, depending on what your Invisalign pricing is, you know, the 5,500 for us is pretty standard here in Southern California, and then we've got the $500 in retention, anywhere between 395 to 500, where it shows on the bottom of your screen. I always charge for my retainers. Um, I don't include those, but I can either cre create a scenario where patients are included into that Propel fee, or we do it a la carte. The patient now has a flat fee and they pay the Propel independently, which at that point, you know, it's, it's going to be a $600 charge or a $500 charge. In my fee, I do talk about quadrants because we do multiple quadrants, but I only charge them one, char one, one charge, meaning the $500 is per quadrant, but I give them the other three quadrants as free of charge. Why do I do it that way? Because I know some doctors, you might be wanting to bill the insurance for the 
alveoplasty and non-extraction of teeth, you can do that. But in my case, I don't bill all four quadrants. I don't need to. Uh, if the patient's paid me out of pocket, no need for me to trigger any insurances. But those of you who always wonder, well, can I get insurance? Can I not? I know some of the doctors uh, that I've spoken to, <clears throat> they said they've been uh, successful in billing the alveoplasty or the corticotomy. That's fine. I'll show you some codes with that. But again, in my uh, textbook of insurances, and again, I've put all of this on atai.com for you to download. I've always liked to be very transparent in what the patient's paying for. And if I decide to give them a discount, great, I'll go ahead and, and, and give them a discount. But the reality is I show them what they're responsible for the amount. So the insurance billing codes, is, as part one we discussed, this is also uh, the D7320. So some of the doctors use that. I always write, write I use Propel. Um, I, I, I show the insurances what I've done. I do discuss, you know, send photos uh, because I don't want them to think that I flapped anything and I did the corticotomy. I didn't do any of that. What I really did was a microosseous perforation and I did and, and I bill for the quad. I don't bill for all four quads because sometimes the insurance companies, you can potentially do what? You can potentially bill the entire four quads and you'll get paid on it. But guess what happens? Now the patient's responsible for the copay. Now you've got yourself into a scenario where they say, wait a minute, you got an extra thousand or two thousand dollars out of my insurance. Then what did I pay you for? So in this case, I usually just do one quad if I have to. But most importantly, if the patient's paying out of pocket, there's no reason for me to trigger the insurance companies. But some insurances cover it, some don't. That's something for you to check for benefits and, and see whether or not that is a covered benefit for the patient. All right, let's see what other questions we've got coming on. I'm trying to answer you as it comes along because the um, uh, last time we ran out of time, so we couldn't get this uh, process. So yeah, when to use the, the microosseous perforations? Well, I like to hand six aligners and six-week recalls. So patients come in every six weeks. They're changing the aligners every seven days, although these days I've been having them change uh, four day at a time. This is in the past uh, seven to eight months. I've seen it track well, but you know it increased the predictability. Your office is, is contingent on how you run it. I check my interapproximation. I look and see any kind of um, spaces that need to be created in the IPR, make sure the attachments are still on, and the patient comes back every six weeks. Um, those of you who are changing or those of you who are, have the patients change every three days, I haven't been so brave to do that just yet as a standard. I do a one-off here, one-off there, patients compliance if they're really good. But typically, I have them change it every seven-day intervals. I go ahead and do the microperforation at the beginning. If it's a patient, some of you may have patients who are already in the middle of treatment. Great. You can go ahead and start now as long as the aligners are tracking and go ahead and have them change the aligners once every seven days and hand them six trays at a time and see them every six weeks. So the first 12 weeks, I get most of my major movement. I don't have to give them another propel if I don't need to, if the major movements are done. So I'm pretty much done with one treatment on that patient. Uh, using the V Pro 5 with the vibration sometimes uh, will help in, in finalization, but most of the time uh, it's one or the other in my office. And I've been able to kind of use both and kind of weave through the um, Invisalign process. And it is a premium option. I mean, this is something that I can either go back and, you know, help with my tracking on some of the cases that are not tracking well. Um, you know, again, uh, I have vibration at my disposal or the mops, microosseous perforation at my disposal. So I'm able to use both um, in these um, cases. So I hope that kind of gives the doctors a, a little bit of a better understanding. Um, and as we introduce more um, webinars and more cases, um, please keep your questions coming. Uh, I'll try my best in answering them offline. Those of you who are uh, still sending some questions, I do have um, a lot of information uh, on the uh, atai.com site, as well as my email, the doctoratai.com. I'm more than happy to share any additional thoughts with you. Um, I do want to go ahead and, and say my uh, goodbyes. And if there's uh, no other questions, then at this point, I hope you got a little bit something out of it in discussing not only just the MOPS, but also the Vibro 5, the Vipro 5, and helping you 
in getting much better predictable outcomes and those of you who do a orthodontic treatments with clear or wires or any other processes in your office that has to do with orthodontics. I thank you very much. Have a good rest of the evening.